This is Our View, brought to you by the proud members of the Washington Federation of State Employees, the people who work for you. The Federation just held its biennial convention. It was a time to celebrate our success of the past, take on the challenges we face today, and thank an outgoing president who has led us through some difficult times. We also use this time to dedicate ourselves to supporting all those who labor, turning our support into action on the street. Well, I think the story to tell is, is uh, getting people involved, getting people to, uh, to uh, better what they do as, as far as uh, uh, the job that they do, the service that they provide uh, to the citizens of the state of Washington. And when you go out and relate to folks what, what you've done and what the union has done for you to help you out as far as, you know, pensions or, or benefits, wages, or, or just helping out people that have been involved in floods and things like that, uh, getting people, that helps to get people active and, and join the union and, and, and work towards things and helping better things for them. But I will tell you that I will continue to do everything within my power to ensure that you get the, the respect that you deserve in the job that you do. Thank you very much for what you do for Russia's sake. One of the things that you do is care for the most vulnerable in our society. And I just, from the bottom of my heart, I want you to, I want to thank you for taking care of my Uncle Eddie. General thoughts on the convention so far is that I think it's a great opportunity to spread the word of who we are and also to initiate new members. Um, I think that I came in this way and I feel that I see a lot of new people. They are starting to understand the workings of the union, what it's about, and what we stand for. Washington State is going to move forward, not backward, and that includes taking care of our working families. That's what I say we ought to be doing. Lastly, but not least, I want to say that I'm very proud to be part of the greatest union in the state of Washington. I think that, that there's a lot of new folks and uh, at the convention this time, and I think that there's a lot of enthusiasm. I think we did a lot of good stuff this year in 2013, and I can only hope that we're going to do even better in the years to come. That we got a lot of compliments about being up on the hill and being activists with the legislature so that we were able to get some things and keep our things like our health care and keep it at a decent rate that we're looking at maybe getting some cola and some of those things that we've been missing and that our pension is safe. You've been my family for all these many years, and I've, you know, I can't tell you how much I have loved the journey that we've taken together. There is not a stronger trade unionist, one who is dedicated, one who is committed, not only in the state of Washington, but across this country, and that's Carol, and that's Carol. To have the opportunity to say goodbye to Carol and thank you for everything that she's invested in me. She's empowered me in, in ways that it took a lifetime to get the knowledge and the wisdom. And oh my God, it's a <laughs> there are no words. The things that I thought would be impossible, the things that, that I've learned, there's no mountain. Every time I turn around, I'm constantly, constantly meeting politicians or going places and having access to wisdom and knowledge. 
I will never be the same, literally never, ever, ever be the same if it had not been for Woofsey, Ask Me, and Carol, who came to my local, who always encouraged me, who always set me up on different committees, who never failed to send me on conventions or send me off to classes. Oh my gosh, what I have is invaluable, invaluable. I'm a shop steward with the Department of Health, and, and I have been for at least two years now. We're here at, a, at our statewide convention, and, and it, it just only made sense to hold a rally in, in support of this, this Proposition 1, being labor and, and fighting for uh, a, a decent pay and a living wage. The more you travel, the more you realize that the issues we face are shared with a lot of other people. Not being able to find work after about age 55 is a serious financial problem for many American workers, likewise in Europe. A recent job fair in Paris targeted older workers to inform them of possible retraining programs, and even some agencies attended who are recruiting aged workers for specialized employment. It can be a long time between out of work and retirement. In France, retirement takes over around 64, 65 years old. But now with new laws, some have to work longer to benefit from a full pension. Many choose to work voluntarily, even with high unemployment in Europe. At the Senior Citizen Trade Show in Paris, I found out more. La question de l'emploi des seniors en France, elle nous pose problème depuis un certain nombre d'années maintenant. The labor issues regarding senior citizens in France has been discussed just as much as young people's unemployment. In fact, there are similar situations. In France, we have a working force that is functioning like a centrifuge. When you're starting out on your first job, and when you're near the end of your career, you often feel pushed off the market, leaving the generation in the middle, from 30 to 55 year old, all the work and responsibilities, even if they have a lot of expenses with families. Some agencies even specialize now in coaching and recruiting senior citizens, like the agency Recruit for Me. We find all sorts of profiles, from nearly retired people who just need to fill out their few years, to retired people who just want to work. This is the majority of senior citizens we find. Our agency is specialized in coaching people on managing their own time when they retire. In France, the workforce for senior citizens is complicated, except for some who can do management transition. We can see this through the structural way that the labor force works in France. Concentrating on the workers from 30 to 55 year old just leads to sending out our senior citizens on early retirement, leaving way to the younger generation. So there is a transition that dates back from the 80s and the 90s to send out workers on early retirement. Now these methods are revised, since they don't work on the long term. Some companies are interested in mixing senior and junior workers. That's a transfer of knowledge and experience, very intergenerational. But some outfits just say, if we have a majority of young people in our team, having a senior citizen could complicate things in the workforce. So there has to be a balance found between both. I don't think it's because of age discrimination that senior citizens are unemployed, even if there is discrimination. I think it's because of the organization and the way the companies function. I think it's a question of organization and not so much a case of discrimination within the workforce. Some seniors took matters in their own hands and created associations giving out advice to others and young people starting out. We are an association of retired managers, directors and entrepreneurs. This is a non-profit organization. We are all volunteers who bring our experience and knowledge to people and managers starting out and who often need a help. 
Even if discrimination is not always an issue, unemployment is still important for those senior citizens in France. Benjamin Marcus for Our View, Paris, France. One of the more interesting people in American labor history is a woman who once lived in Seattle. Ross Reeder has her story. Anna Louise Strong was born in Friend, Nebraska, of middle-class liberals active in missionary work and the Congregational Church. An unusually gifted child, she raced through grammar in high school, then studied languages in Europe. She graduated from Bryn Mawr, did graduate work at Oberlin, and at age 23, her PhD from the University of Chicago. She was 30 when she returned to live to, in Seattle with her father, the Reverend Sidney Strong, pastor of Queen Anne Congregational Church. She favored the pro-labor and progressive political climate. She also enjoyed mountain climbing, organized cooperative summer camps in the Cascades, and led climbing parties up Mount Rainier. During her Seattle years, 1910 to 21, Anna Louise Strong won election as the lone woman on the school board, only to, re to be recalled because of her overt sympathies with the industrial workers of the world and because of her pacifist stance during World War I. In the year of her election, 1916, the Everett Massacre occurred. Str Strong was a stringer for the New York Evening Post to report on the bloody conflict between the IWW and the armed guards hired by Everett Mill owners to keep them out of town. She became an impassioned and articulate spokesperson for worker rights. Strong's endorsement of controversial liberal causes set her apart from her school board colleagues. She opposed war as pacifist. When the United States entered World War I in 1917, she opposed the draft. The PTA and the women's clubs joined her in opposing military training in the schools. The Seattle Minutemen branded her as unpatriotic. Fellow school board members, quick to launch a recall campaign against Strong, won by a narrow margin. She appeared at her next meeting, at their next meeting, to uh, argue that they appoint a woman as her successor. They replaced her with Evangeline C. Harper, a club woman. Strong became more openly associated with the liberal press, writing pro-labor articles on February 6, 1919, two days before the beginning of the Seattle General Strike. She proclaimed in her famous editorial for the local union record, we are undertaking the most tremendous move ever made by labor in this country, a move which will lead no one where knows. The strike shut down the city for four days, ending as it had begun, peacefully and without its goals. Disillusioned with the erosion of the labor movement, Strong had nothing to keep her in Seattle. When Lincoln Stephanus lectured in Seattle about his trip to Russia, Strong accepted his advice and went to Moscow. For several years, she supported herself as a foreign correspondent for radical American newspapers. In 1958, at age 72, she moved to China, where she was one of few Westerners to gain the admiration of Mao Zedong. She remained there until her death in 1970. You've been watching Our View, the television voice of the members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. We are a labor organization that stands for justice in the workplace, not just for us, but for all American workers. And we remind you, when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.